Good morning, everybody. As you know, we're in a series on relationships, and we're going to be talking about two things this week and next week about something that I wasn't planning on talking about uh, during this during this topic, uh, and that's the lies that society gives us about relationships. Because if we swallow those lies, if we swallow the Kool-Aid that, that our society tries to give us, then uh, we're not gonna have good relationships. We're never gonna have the relationships that God intends us to have. And today we're gonna be talking about something near and dear to every single one of our hearts, and that's the, the, the topic of, of love. Because every single one of us, we wanna hear words like this. We wanna hear words like, I love you. I wanna spend the rest of my life with you. Will you marry me? I adore you. You're the most important person in my life. I enjoy talking to you. I have so much respect for you. When you walk in a room, I come alive. When I hear the garage door open, I get excited because I can't wait to see you. You make my heart go hubba hubba, I love you. And you know, when we think about it, God was the one that created love. And because of that, he knows exactly how it should, should work. He knows how it does work and how it doesn't work. He knows how it will thrive and how it will, will decline or not even be. You know, I, I know this story, I know I've told this story before, but it had a profound effect on my life. I've thought about this a lot. Uh, back during Hurricane Andrew, when it wiped out the uh, part of, uh, of Florida, there was a, a, a newscast that, that I'll never forget. And what happened is you saw block after blocks of, of houses that were completely destroyed, I mean to the ground, and there was one house that stood. And I mean, not only did it stand, it looked like nothing had ever happened to it. I mean, there wasn't, it didn't seem like any shingles were off. It didn't seem like anything was off. The trees in the front and everything were wasted, but it was standing completely untouched. And the, the newscaster came up and asked the person, how is your house standing when the other houses are so, so uh, destroyed? And he said, well, I, I, I did it by the book. Florida says, here's how you make your house uh, where it can survive the, the hurricanes. And he said, when it said to put a bracing here, I put a bracing there. When it said to put these types of shingles on, I put those types of shingles on. And I did it by the book and my house stands. And I think in the same way, we can either do love, we can do relationship by God's book, by the book, the one that, that created it and knows how it works, or we can do it by the, the lies of the enemy and by the Kool-Aid that the, our society tries to tell us about what love is and about what relationships are all about. Now, if you're single, uh, this, which about half of our congregation is, this will directly apply to, uh, to you. And what you can do is you can build your house either for the first time or again in a new marriage on, on the principles that we're about to lay down. And for those who are married, which is the other half in our, uh, in our church, then you can retrofit this. And no matter how good or not good your, uh, your marriage is, this can make it become way, way better. We're gonna be taking a look at, at one little part of a chapter in the Bible. We're gonna have an introduction before that. This is the lie that society gives us. Is It says this, if I can just meet and marry the right person, then I will live, we will live happily ever after. And isn't that really the, the plot of, of virtually every single romance movie that has ever been, been made? What you have is boy meets girl, sparks fly, chemistry happens, and then, then not only that, but then they, despite some, whatever odds they face, everything works out. If it's a, a drama, then the dramatic odds that they face, then the things work out. If it's a comedy, then comedic things happen. If it's adventure, then adventure things happen. But eventually, what happens is they live happily ever after. Now, if that were truly true, we would not have the third highest divorce rate in the, the world, in our nation. That 50% that of, the, of the marriages that happen in our nation would not end in divorce. And you'd also have, it seems like the, the happiest couples, the greatest, the strongest couples would come directly from Hollywood because isn't that where, where just the, the magic happens and where those, the chemistry takes place and everything. But as you and I know that that's some of the worst track records in Hollywood of any relationships that, they, that there are. The focus of the Kool-Aid love is finding. And the quality that is most important is, is chemistry. 
And you know what I'm talking about, two people meet and, and there's the, that feeling inside and they, you, you just start thinking about the other person all the time, you talk about the other person all the time and then you, you, you draw closer and, and then that uh, you even have a song, you think that there's nobody that's ever loved like this before, but, and, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the chemistry. I mean, God put it inside of us where we feel that attraction towards, uh, towards another person and everything. The chemistry itself, is there's nothing wrong with that. It's, but here's the Kool-Aid, is when all you have is the, the chemistry. The, the chemistry without character equals chaos. Let me say that again. Chemistry without character leads to chaos. The chemistry love isn't sustainable. It's like jumping out of an airplane. Now I've jumped out of an airplane several times and I love it. I enjoy that feeling. It's an incredible adrenal rush. I love the feeling of flying, but it's not sustainable. Eventually reality kicks in. Eventually gravity kicks in. Eventually you better have a parachute. Likewise, the chemistry couple truly believes that the powerful chemistry that they share will keep them together forever. But then here's the problem. Reality sets in and the relationship begins to have problems, which, which all relationships do. And when those difficulties start showing their ugly head, what suffers is the chemistry. What has been hot and passionate and awesome, that begins to cool. And the relationship starts to die. And they find themselves on different sides of the bed, wondering what in the world ever happened. They're only three feet apart, but they might as well be 100 miles apart and growing further. It's a chemistry experiment that's gone bad. And you're left with two people who are brokenhearted and disillusioned. Now the guy gets confused when there's not as, as much chemistry as there, there once was. And he, he thinks, you know what we need? To get the chemistry back, we need more physical intimacy. That's guy's answers to everything. It could be a leaky faucet and his answer would be more physical intimacy. But then the, the lady, what she thinks is, you know what, we need to get the chemistry back and I know what we need. We need, we need to have a baby. Well, isn't that a genius thing that you bring, you bring another life into what's, what's working as, as a dysfunction to, to start with. But the guy's thinking, hey, that, that leads to physical intimacy, so, so let's, let's go for it. You know, there's two times when men are more susceptible to, to having an affair, and one of those is when his wife is, is pregnant. And I know what the ladies must be thinking of going, oh, that's great. She's trying to save the marriage, getting intimacy back to back where, where it was, and he's off gallivanting around. But that's where the Kool-Aid type of love eventually leads. And maybe, maybe he's not as attracted to his wife as he was or not feeling the, the same ushy-gushy feeling. And, and then he meets Sally at, at work, and all of a sudden he has these feelings, and he recognizes those feelings because he used to have those feelings towards his wife. And so what he's feeling now is, well, well I know what must happen. I must be married to the wrong person. And since I'm fe having these feelings towards Sally, then Sally must be the right person. And before you just dog the guys, remember, this is a 50-50 thing. And maybe, maybe Susan's going to the, the gym and, and she sees Tony and she hasn't seen Tony for several years and she used to date Tony and Tony's just as nice as he used to be. And, and she has these feelings all of a sudden of chemistry going on and, and she recognizes those feelings because she used to have those feelings for her husband. But so now she thinks, well, maybe if it's chemistry, then, then I must be married to the wrong person. And, and because I'm feeling this towards Tony, then and Tony must be the right person. Do you see where the heartache is? Do you see where this, this always ends in heartache and always, always pain and suffering and everything? That is where the Kool-Aid love will eventually lead us. I'll give you a statistic that doesn't make a lick of sense if the Kool-Aid love actually works, but it makes perfect sense if the Kool-Aid love is a lie. And that's the fact that second marriages are twice as likely to fail as first marriages. And you're wondering how in the world could that be? It's because the people are doing the exact same thing, expecting different results. They're focusing a, again on finding and the quality that they're looking for is, is chemistry. And when the chemistry starts to wane, when there's problems or difficulties or anything, they're left wondering, how in the world did I do this? I did it again. I, I found the wrong person once again. Here's the problem. Neither one of them have been focusing on character and relationship. 
The result, you have two people with shallow character, neither of which know how to do relationship. And maybe for months they've been focusing on the marriage ceremony, but the problem is for years they've been developing relational habits that will sabotage their marriage once that happens. So how do we counteract the Kool-Aid? We focus not on finding the right person, we focus on becoming the right person. Let me tell you one young lady's story. She grew up in church, she grew up going to Sunday school, she grew up going to youth group as well, and she had a true faith. And then when she went to college, she just kind of wandered from the, the faith. She did not renounce her faith or anything like that, she just kind of had her faith on the back burner. And she started doing the whole college dating scene where you know, she'd have some flings and she had some one night stands and she had some short term relationships but all of it just left her really empty. But then one night she met a young man that, that had it all. I mean he had, he had the looks, he had great personality, he was, he was funny, he had a good job, most of all he had a faith. And I mean, his faith was so attractive. His faith was not on the back burner. His faith was absolutely front and center in everything that he did. It was in front and center in his job. It was front and center in his dating relationship as well. And this lady was highly attracted to, to him. Well, she, she ran home to her mom and said, man, I, you wouldn't believe the guy that I met today. And she told him all about him and, and about his character and told about his faith. And, and his, his, her mom said something that racked her world. She looked at her daughter and said, honey, the man you're talking about wouldn't be interested in a girl like you, what you've become. And she literally hit the floor and began to, to, to sob. And she knew her mom was, was right. She knew that the kind of guy that she wanted in her heart of hearts would not be interested in the girl that she had become. But here's the good news. The good news is it was a defining moment in her, her life. And she decided that that moment that she was gonna focus on becoming the right person rather than finding the right person. Andy Stanley, years ago, I heard him ask a question to singles that I think is absolutely brilliant. And, and here it is. Are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? Let me, let me say that again. Are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Because we all have a list, don't we? You have a list about the, the character qualities you would like in, in the person, the faith that you'd like in that person, the integrity that you'd like them to have, the value system that you would like them to pass on to your, your children, the addictions you would not like them to have, and the relationship with God that you'd like them to have. But here's the question that I ask you. Are you becoming that kind of person that the person you're looking for is looking for? I want you to notice something, that the Bible says very little, very little about finding the right person. There's nowhere in there that you'll see to go to this particular place, you wear this particular dress, you stash on this kind of cologne, you use this uh, pickup line. The Bible doesn't have it, but the Bible has an absolute ton about how to become the right person. And this shouldn't come a shock to us because God's the one that created relationship. As I said, God's the one that's put that in your heart that you want to love and you want to be loved. So here's the thing, we can either do it God's way and we can build that house the way it's supposed to be built or we can swallow the lie and build on a foundation that's not gonna last the test of, a test of time. You are made for deep and wonderful relationships and for a deep and wonderful marriage, but it doesn't happen on accident. It happens when you have two people intentional about becoming, not finding. And it doesn't just happen if you just kiss enough frogs or you make yourself available to more and more people of the opposite sex. I wanna say again, chemistry without character only leads to chaos and heartache. And our entire culture is a testament to that kind of heartache and that kind of Kool-Aid love. And you may say, okay, Lowell, you've proved your point. What do I do about it? Well, here's the good news. God gives us a list. So if you're a single, you can look at this list and you can say this, if I do this, it's gonna really help me become the person that the person I'm looking for is looking for. If you're married and you look at this list, I guarantee you it's gonna make your marriages stronger if you live by what this, this list says. 
And I wanted to say a couple of things, a few things about the list. First of all, the things on this list will benefit every single relationship you have. It will benefit the relationship you have with your brother or your sister or your, with your parents, with your children, with your spouse, with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, the people that you go to work with, the people that you go to school with, the people on your team. Every single relationship that you have will benefit from doing the things on this list. The other thing is nothing on this list will be talking about finding. Everything on this list will talk about becoming. And I want to give a warning, if you're married, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to think about, okay, how is my spouse living up to this list? I don't want you to do that. I want you to totally think about yourself, to think it's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's not my spouse, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And something that I do on a regular basis is I look at this list and I put my name, I substitute my name there for every time the word love is, is mentioned. So I want us to take this personally, not think about anybody else, but think about ourselves and how we live according to this list. And one final thing is we're all going to fall short, uh, sometimes woefully short of the things on this, on this list. So give ourselves some break. This is, but this is the goal. This is where we should be headed. These are the things that we should be striving towards on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So what is the list? Uh, God's list comes straight from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the love chapter. This one talks about God's definition of love, not the Kool-Aid love, God's definition of love. And it begins by saying this, that love is patient. We don't, we don't live in a very patient society, do we? We want everything yesterday. But love says, you know what, I'll wait for things. I will, uh, I, I'm not going to press the other person. I'm not going to push the other person. Another word for patience is long suffering. That means we're willing to, to suffer long. It means we're willing to go through things with the other person and for the other person. The next one is love is, is kind. Kind means just you're considerate. You're considerate about the other person and their feelings and, and, and you, you want what is best for the other person. You, you, you do the person good and you never ever intentionally do the person harm. The third one is love does not envy. So what is envy? Envy means you want what the other person has. It's you want their life, you want their talents, you want their blessings, you want their what, whatever. And so that means that you, when everybody else is applauding them and, and everything, you don't wanna do that. That's what envy is. In fact, if you have a low self image that you don't feel good about yourself, and if you don't feel good about yourself, you, you sure don't want another person feeling good about themselves either. And, and, and if you start feeling good about yourself, I'm going to make sure you, you stop feeling good about yourself. And here's the weird thing about envy, that sometimes it's the very thing that attracted you to the other person that now bugs you. Maybe they were, they're, they're smart, maybe they're intelligent, maybe they're incredibly gifted musically or something like that. And the thing that it once attracted you, if you have a low self-image, if you envy, it's gonna start bugging you over time. I know a, a, a lady who this happened to, that, that she was attracted to, uh, to her husband because he was, uh, he was smart, he was fun, he was funny, he was a person of high character and, and everything. And, uh, but then you could watch as envy crept into uh, to, to her heart. And you could even see it on her face that when, when her husband was ever applauded or complimented or anything like that, you could see it on her face, the envy that she had. And she didn't want him feeling good about himself because she felt bad about herself. And she made sure when he got home that he was cut down a notch or two in order to make him feel bad about himself like she felt bad about herself. So if you have a low self-image of yourself and you are unmarried, please get help, uh, get some counseling and things because otherwise you're gonna bring that into your, your marriage and, and you're, gonna, you're gonna sabotage your marriage in a way that you don't intend to. And if you're, you're married and you have a low self-image, again, get help, get some counseling because the, the chances are you're gonna, you're gonna be working against your spouse's success in a way that you don't ever intend to and that's completely unhealthy. The next thing is that the, the Bible says it, that love does not boast and it is not proud. 
This is the opposite extreme from envy. Envy stem, stems from a low self-image, and pride comes from an, an over-inflated self-image. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 12, don't think of yourself self more highly than you ought. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has, has given you. And what's the opposite of, uh, of, of pride? It's humility. It's meaning that we really look for the other person, what's good for the other, other person. It means we're willing to say, I'm sorry. It means we're willing to, to, to put the other person above us. And I know what some of you may be thinking. You may be thinking, does this, does this really work? And, and maybe it even sounds, sounds boring as you try to picture, picture people that are really trying to work out their differences in a, in a patient way. But let me ask you this, those of you who have ever come from a, a dysfunctional family, a family where there's a lot of hostility, or maybe your parents where they, they got a divorce, let me just ask you, if, if you started living by this, if they started living, if the family started living by, by the, this list, and they were patient with each other, they weren't in, in sick competition with each other, they forgave each other, they took each other's needs and concerns in, into heart, they were truly kind, they never tried to do harm for, for the other person, they admitted when they were wrong, do you think that would maybe help out? Do you think maybe things would be, be better in that relationship? Maybe that family dynamic, that marriage dynamic would be stronger? And let me say this, this is not what you see in Hollywood at all, this list. Because yelling and screaming and dysfunction and everything, that's what sells, that's what's exciting. This is not as exciting, but I'll tell you, this is what works. This is the thing that stands the test of time. This isn't the Kool-Aid type of love. This is God's type of love and it works. The next one that it talks about is love is not rude. Now, none of us like to spend time hanging around a rude person. So this is kind of self-explanatory. The next one is love is not self-seeking. I don't know if you've noticed, but none of the things on this list comes naturally, right? I mean, chemistry comes naturally. All you need is some hormones or need some chemistry and it's two sticks rubbed together. Boom, you got that. But these things do not come naturally. And of all the things on the list, not being self-seeking probably is the one that comes least natural to us. Because let's be, you know, think of the, one of the first th words that ever come out of our mouth is mine, mine, mine. We come out of the womb self-centered, self-seeking. So what is the opposite of being self-seeking? It means we look after the needs of the other person. We care about their thoughts. We care about their feelings. We care about their emotions. We care about what they are going through, not just focus on ourself. The Bible then tells us that love is not easily angered. Another verse says, or translation says, love is not irritable. So it means if, if you're always ticked off, if you're always irritable, if you're always in a mood, you aren't being very loving. And somebody may say, well, that's just my personality. No, it's not. I mean, that's, that's a learned behavior. And if you have, uh, we have no control over death or taxes, but we have control on our attitude. We have control whether we're being uh, easily angered or not. The Bible says that love keeps no record of wrongs. I like the story about the, the two guys that were talking and one of the guys said, every time my wife and I have a fight, she gets historical. And he said, don't you mean hysterical? And he said, no, historical. Every time we are in a fight, she brings up every stupid thing that I've ever done wrong. Let me ask you something. Do you have a list? Do you have a list that you, you bring out every time you, you have a, a disagreement with maybe your, your, your wife or your husband or your child or anything like that, and every time they do something stupid, every time they do something wrong, you just add that to the list? Let me ask you this. Do you think God enjoys that list? Let me ask you this, imagine Satan on one side and God on the other. Which is the one, that, who is, is the one who always rubs our face in the mud? Who's the one that always reminds us of everything that we've done wrong? Who is the accuser of the brethren? Is it Jesus or is it Satan? You know what that means? It means every time that we add something to the list, who are we acting like? We're acting like the accuser of the brethren. We're acting like the one who rubs our face in the, in the dirt all the time. I thank God that we have a God of the second chances who always forgives and who, who, thank God, gets rid of the list when we're under Jesus Christ. The Bible says that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. You know what that means? That means we, we always treat somebody in a way that never leads to regret, but would always bring a smile to the face of Jesus. 
That means, you know, we would not cheat a person because that doesn't bring a, a smile to the face of Jesus. That means we don't lie because that wouldn't bring a smile. We don't abuse anybody. And something, I know this isn't going to be popular, but I just want to tell the, the truth. That means we don't have sex with a person outside of marriage. You know why? Because that doesn't bring a smile to the face of Jesus. You may think you're loving the person, but you're not loving the other person because Jesus would not smile on that. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love always protects. It, it protects the object of the love physically, spiritually, and emotionally. You know what, teens, that means when your parents say that they don't want, like somebody you're hanging around with, a group you're hanging around with, you know why they do that? It's purely because they love you and they want to, to protect you. And real love perseveres. It makes it through the difficult times. You know, the, the, the Kool-Aid love, the chemistry love, just says, as long as it feels good, I'm with you. But as long as that, uh, as soon as that, that chemistry, as soon as that, that ushy-gushy goes, I'm out of here. But here's the thing, too. With, with the real love, the persevering love, the love that God's talking about, as you persevere, you can go through tough times. You're going to go through tough times in life and in every relationship. But as you go through it, that relationship can even be stronger as you persevere together. And here's how we can build the house. This is how our house can flourish and stand when all the other houses around us are crumbling, just like that guy in, in Florida. The single person, you live according to this, this list, and you become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. And married people, this is how we fortify the house, by doing these very things. And I'm going to say the list again. I'm going to say the, say the list. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You guys, love never, ever fails. God bless you.